passion. Uh, if don't don't work for money, not in this space. In this space, uh, the market cycles. If you work here for four or five years, you'll get the money. Follow your passion. Hey everybody, Tanner here with Wagme Ventures. On today's episode, we have Griff Green, founder of Giveth and Common Stack. For anyone who's new, this is the Wagme Ventures podcast, where we do snapshots with interesting founders from across Web3. Check out wagmeventures.io to learn more about the syndicate beyond the podcast. But for now, let's get into it with Griff Green. Hey, everybody. This is Tanner with Wagme Ventures. I'm here for our first episode of 2023, and I'm excited to share with you the first guest for the year. Uh, his name is Griff Green, founder of Giveth and Common Stack, among a lot of other projects. So, uh, Griff, how's it going today? GM Tanner. It's going well, man. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm really excited to talk here. I mean, there's almost too much to talk about, but we'll <laughs> see how we do, right? So, you know, it's it's no secret to pretty much anyone who's familiar with your work that you've you've had a pretty remarkable impact on the crypto community, and it's spanned a ton of different projects across the community since 2015, right? Yeah. So, I guess I'm curious how you would describe your journey thus far, and if you could maybe take us back to the beginning and give us maybe I don't know, like the medium length version of how you got started in crypto, <laughs> yeah, and what your paths looked like yeah. since then. Yeah, there's a, man, you know, it's like where to start. Like, oh my God, I was born in Spokane, Washington. No, you know, it's like, uh, but, but really, you know, something happened to me when I was, uh, I was actually an activist uh, in, around s several movements and a community organizer specifically within the Save Our Sonics movement, which is a basketball team, an NBA basketball team in Seattle that was bought and now is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And so I was working within the system to try to keep that team there because I just love the NBA and I love the Sonics. And I was kind of general of the fans and running most of the community organization of the for that organization. And, uh, and, and then we were about to win. There was a court case that was going to keep the city, the, the team in town for the next two years. And from there, we just, they would be stuck there. There's no way that we wouldn't have been able to motivate uh, catalyze the community around it. And then with a stroke of a pen, the mayor just like the day the judge was supposed to give a verdict and say, the team is stuck here for two years. The judge, uh, the, the judge never got to give that verdict because the mayor made a deal with the guy who owned the team and just signed the team away. After two years of, you know, community organizing grassroots, like trying to stop this thing, the government and the local city government in cahoots with some rich people said, eh, we don't care what you think. Right. And that sent me off into an anarchist path. I just don't care. We got to be able to do better than governments. And that's, that's, this is, this is what really um, spiraled me into. I, I used to be a chemical engineer designing power plants. I gave that up to become effectively a guy who made money off of Craigslist and uh, I was a, became a massage, a Thai massage therapist and was doing Thai massage uh, and traveling the world nomadically because I didn't want to live in the States. And I actually didn't even have a bank account for a while. Uh, I was storing my value in physical gold and silver. And so obviously Bitcoin became an interest of, to me because it was a way to store value in a much more uh, accessible manner and fungible, like a uh, divisible manner than physical gold and silver. And uh, I got into it in 2013. I'd heard about it a little bit before, but wiring money to Japan and Mt. Gox wasn't my thing. So in 2013, I stopped being a massage therapist and uh, just gave all of my efforts into crypto. I ended up starting a master's degree in digital currencies and Ended up graduating actually with the first degree ever in digital currencies, a master's degree from the University of Nicosia. And uh, I started this project with, uh, within the eco Ethereum ecosystem uh, with Slocket called the DAO. And the DAO, well, it has a people write books about this stuff. So I don't want to talk about the DAO too much because it happened so long ago and there's a lot of resources, but it kind of blew up and uh, and was hacked for $50 million. And it was like the biggest thing in 2016 in the Ethereum space. And it's, uh, 
it didn't go well. And that was me and the Slocket team there. Uh, Christoph, I think, was on this podcast, right? So, yep. uh, so you probably, any everyone who's listened to that episode knows probably enough about it. And uh, after that, uh, the the group that I led, the White Hat Hacker Group, uh, we we rescued the DAO. And later on, we rescued also $210 million from the par- first parity multi-sig hack. Uh, we started this organization called Giveth. And the idea was to change the way we, first off, to take the lessons of the DAO and apply it to a safer context. It's a VC capital. Let's see if we can make DAOs for charities that can uh, be sustainable. But also really behind the scenes, we really are just a bunch of crypto anarchists. And we believe that we can build systems that are better than governments uh, at solving the problems governments make. And so that's really where I've been spending all of my time, 80 hours a week in the crypto space, nonstop since 2015, really, is how do we build, using Web3 technology, how do we build systems better than governments? And the thesis that the theory of change that we're working with is that when when governments fail to provide services that the society demands, people start nonprofits. And if a government wants to enter a nonprofit space, they have, you know, they, they have complete uh, a monopoly over everything. And so, uh, but the goal is if we could actually make nonprofits stronger than governments, if we can get rid of that word nonprofit and realize that these organizations are creating value for society and give them a way to create an economic system behind the value they create so that they can be beyond sustainable, regenerative, effectively profitable, then we can take this Web3, uh, like this magic of, of uh, issuance and apply it in local contexts for small, small communities that just want to provide value to society. If we can give them the power to be sustainable and regenerative, they can actually solve problems better than governments can. And they won't need taxes to do it. They'll do it in a profitable way like a corporation does it. Uh, so that's really the goal of Giveth and, and almost all the projects that I've spun out uh, from 2016, 2017. Uh, I've helped organize conferences around scaling, <clears throat> scaling now in 2018, which was before rollups and, and all that really connecting the community together. Uh, we, we were one of the first, we helped start uh, Gnosis Chain, which was one of the first side chains to Ethereum. And I mean, so many other, uh, and of course we have our donation application, uh, which meets nonprofits where they are. And, uh, but we're also working on how do we bring all of the innovations in the Web3 space from NFTs to quadratic funding to, to, uh, to the nonprofit space and, and give them access to these tooling so we can turn these nonprofit rock stars, the people who know how to solve problems on the ground and give them a sustainable way, a regenerative way to solve those problems without needing donations or taxes. So yeah, that's that's like my story. That's what motivates me. And uh, and really, I feel like that used to be the the main theme behind crypto when I got involved. So I'm I'm trying to keep it alive. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so we could obviously dig into a, a million different angles on this. So I think I want to maybe go into some of your influences here. So on a podcast, for example, I, I listened to you, I think it was with uh, Unit Network. You'd mm-hmm. mentioned that you've been seriously influenced by the Nobel Prize winning economist, Eleanor Ostrom. Yeah. And so I'm hearing I'm hearing kind of echoes in, in what you're saying uh, from some of her work and, and some of, yeah, I, I guess I'm just curious. Can you Can you talk a little bit about what her work kind of unlocked for you in terms of what you think of as possible or what's important to pay attention to? Yeah, you know, Eleanor Ostrom really makes huge strides in disproving the tragedy of the commons. So the idea of the tragedy of the commons is that people will not, uh, if, if uh, you know, if the, you have a bu- you have an open space and everyone's raising cattle, uh, you know, if the if the open space can only handle a hundred cattle, like how do you stop people from adding more? And and the the classic paper says, well, you can't. That's why you need big government to come in and say you can only you have to have a license to to graze your cattle here, and they'll only give out a hundred of them. And Eleanor Ostrom says, are you kidding? People aren't that dumb. You don't need to use force to do this. People are smart, and if 
you can do it with a government. You can also do it, which is powered by people. You can also just cut the government out and go straight to the people and allow them to create their own rules around grazing cattle uh, from the bottom up. And she has these eight principles that I really feel everyone in crypto should read about, you know, creating strong boundaries, nested enterprises, conflict resolution. And, and she derived these eight, these eight principles of what make a, a successful commons from field studies of organizations that were solving problems governments solve without government uh, influence uh, within uh, a public kind of a public goods scenario, right? So public goods as in non-excludable goods. So they're solving problems that usually you'd want governments to solve, but without governments, without donations, just with bottom-up rules and communication, right? If the the way you, you, the reason why this whole try to do the commons idea is just bunk is because the, it assumes people aren't talking to each other. It assumes that people want to exploit. And if you are a rational economic being, I could see why, why you come to that, um, you know, that eventual like theory, but we are not rational economic beings. We are social creatures and we have other interests and, and it's important to most humans that they feel accepted, that they are doing right, that they feel good as a, as a, as a person. And, and so this, uh, the comments, uh, the commons theory that Eleanor Ostrom puts out there doesn't have Web3 included, but it has been used by academics, uh, especially people with an academic mindset, but also, uh, you know, a lot of people in this whole commons movement to build really interesting regenerative systems uh, without Web3. If, if we can inject the ability to issue your own currency and create an economy on top of a commons, I believe that we can take the the best of both worlds, that we can build systems like Bitcoin, uh, where, you know, every 10 minutes, some tokens are just created out of nothing and then used to support, uh, to reward people who are creating collective value, uh, the miners. Uh, we can apply those same principles to other in real life, like meat space uh, dynamics. And, but in meat space, you have to, also <laughs> deal with humans. So it's not just computers. And Eleanor Austin yeah. really has provided the best template for dealing with humans, which is sticky and, and you need to manage conflicts and, and these, these, other, these other tools. So I, I think uh, if we're going to do in real life public infrastructure around uh, nonprofit type projects, then we need to take the best of the best lessons that are already out there. And no, nothing's better than Eleanor Austin. Love it. Yeah. Okay, so along those same lines, what are your thoughts these days on governance possibilities? Where, you know, I recall kind of hearing you talk elsewhere about this distinction between soft governance, which seemed to me like kind of like the meetings behind the meetings almost, or versus like hard governance, which is kind of the stuff we usually think of as governance in kind of crypto or Web3, or yeah. you know, voting on proposals, et cetera. Yeah, in crypto, you know, I think hard governance is basically like token weighted voting of some sort or some kind of token powered voting. You could even say Gitcoin hard governance is like they collect donations and then do the quadratic funding formula. And that's kind of the hard governance. But the soft governance of Gitcoin, which people don't even think of it as a governance protocol, but it really is. It's like governance over this matching pool of funds. Uh, sure. the, the, the hard governance is the donations to the projects and the civil civil um, protection that is that is applied, and then the soft governance is you know just talking on on Twitter like sharing the cards yeah. so people can donate to these projects and and like the cultural um, you know stories that are used to to really compel people to vote a certain way. And it's really important to have awareness of the power of the soft governance, the cultural uh, underpinnings that end up mm, creating these the reactions to hard governance. And they really work well together. So that's that's kind of a – that's just something that we all need to recognize that, like, you know, people are uh, going to – that that soft governance really impacts uh, our hard governance, especially in crypto where – 
the votes for the most part in 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 hard governance in crypto it's just horrible the the votes are very political and you can see how everyone votes so it's like and you also get real time results so you know almost all crypto votes uh, because of soft governance cuz because of the culture uh, you know people don't want to vote against the crowd and uh, people don't want to have to argue a position if they disagree uh, they they with everyone they just uh, don't vote or and and most if people disagree often they just with the mass masses p- people just uh, don't vote and then they they because there's no chance that they're overruling the masses from their their point of view and most votes mm-hmm. in crypto end up with 95 percent you know, uh, all voting in the same direction, which what votes in the real world end up like that? You know, it's very rare. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. I'm curious then like with, uh, cause I've, I've heard you talk about this notion, uh, here and elsewhere about kind of like, um, maybe micro economies would be the word where yeah. I've heard you say, for example, like, you know, let's replace the next big thing with lots of small things. Yeah. And I guess I'm curious about governance. You know, we, we kind of have an idea of what governance consists of for these massive types of government governance projects, like a government, for example. Mm-hmm. And you you seem to be saying, you know, micro micro economies can be different and we should think about them differently. Like we shouldn't just try and port over ideas from, you know, uh, whatever, like non-crypto world. Like let's think of new ways, but also like let's think smaller and think in ways that align with that smallness. Can you talk a little bit about that? I have so many directions to go with that. First off, uh, this is a David Bollier quote, that the next big thing will be a a ton of small things, will be lots of small things. And the idea of replacing a government with another government is a complete waste of energy. I I don't believe in uh, violent revolutions anymore. I really think we got to build a system that just works better, 10x better, and and that the current government will fade away biggest government failings right now are are the fact that they're all monopolies you know they have a monopoly over every public goods vertical that they choose to participate in and if we want to have a real sustainable uh, solution that's 10 times better than governments we need to integrate the best of free markets we need to have comp- c- groups competing to provide public services you know there there should be uh, it shouldn't be like okay ev- it shouldn't even be like okay let's replace each service government service with one dao it should be let's it should be more like a free market where hey if people like this type of service or that type of service um, you know different organizations can start up and actually satisfy the unmet demands of a community for their public services that they need you know some groups want education public education to work one way others would like another way you know and yeah. and so there's there's a wide i think there's a wide um configuration there's a wide open space here uh for competing organizations to satisfy the needs that we used to rely on um, governments to satisfy but to do that to do that we have to make it easy for groups to start small and that's what crypto is missing for the most part right now it is really difficult to launch a micro economy you know, Giveth can do an airdrop and launch a token. Uh, Gitcoin can do an airdrop and launch a token and seek investment. Uh, that, But those end up being pretty large economies. You know, if you look at any project that you know about, they probably have a market cap of, you know, a million dollars or more. But what if you just want to do a startup? What if you just want to like start a small school for, you know, a small, a small town and that that's doing interesting things and provide the service for free so any any kids can be educated but you're not going to have a 10 million dollar market cap so uh how do you do this how do you integrate web3 and this is where the innovation of bonding curves come in and bonding curves are very simple actually uh, even though it's a scary word it's just a smart contract that can hold money and mints uh mints tokens on demand mints and burns on demand and when a mint happens, the price of the token goes up. When a burn happens, the price of the token goes down in a predictable, deterministic way. And these bonding curves are, uh, I think, the key 
uh, the key innovation. Like I firmly believe that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, Simon de la Rouvier and, uh, and Bancor will share a Nobel Prize in economics because of their work with bonding curves because it really satisfies these uh, li low liquid environments and allows micro economies to emerge in a, in a way that's really safe uh, to scale. And we've seen great success with the token engineering commons. Uh, they, they're our first micro economy and they're uh, built around a public purpose, like a um, public infrastructure for the token engineering space. We, we want to uh, just advance token engineering and make it accessible to anyone who wants to learn so that we can design safe economies that people can trust. Um, imagine, uh, just to define token engineering, uh, imagine that you're building a bridge. Well, you could just go to Home Depot, get some wood and like slap some things together and say you have a bridge, but no one's going to really want to cross it unless you have a civil engineer sign off on it. You're not going to be driving semis across it for the next 40 years unless there's some engineering work done. And that's not common in the space of crypto. I, I really consider uh, all of crypto to be public economic infrastructure. We are building systems that anyone can access. And uh, if they access a, a system that what wasn't properly engineered, they can get hurt. Uh, the biggest example lately, and there's so many, uh, is Luna and Terra and the UST debacle. And they just did not do real token engineering. They could have created uh, configure. They could have designed the configuration space to limit withdrawals, for instance. Uh, they could have restricted certain things. They could have designed the system around potential failure mechanisms, but they didn't. And there was no way for anyone to really know that it wasn't safe because token engineering is such a niche field that no one asks for it. Everyone asks for smart contract audits, but if we actually want to create public economic infrastructure, we need to build the system of token engineering. So Token Engineering Commons launched in 2021 uh, in the summer and uh, did launch, like initialize their, um, their DAO and they sold tokens for a dollar. And at the time, Ether was, uh, was worth $3,000. And, and if you bought... Uh, $1,000 of Ether and $1,000 of TEC tokens. Your TEC tokens are worth about 950 bucks, and your Ether is worth 300 uh, And, you know, as opposed to most micro economies that launched without a bonding curve, the token price was dramatically impacted by the market conditions. But in the TEC, because every token is collateralized by DAI in a bonding curve, and the price action is not as volatile because we're not a pump and dump coin. It's, it's about uh, creating reliable public infrastructure. Uh, it didn't have those, that same volatility risk. Uh, and it, and it just doesn't, it's, it's its own micro economy that people can rely on and, and it makes sense. So uh, building systems like that is really exciting for me and applying those to especially public goods uh, focused projects is really what I spend all my time doing. Yeah, super interesting. So, you know, how would you, across a lot of these projects you're thinking about, you can kind of pick the ones that um, you want to focus on here, but how are you, at the, I mean, at this point in your journey, like how are you defining success at this point for each of these projects? Is it, you know, proving out models? Is it, uh, it doesn't sound like scaling one particular thing to be some massive thing, right? Um, like, how do you how do you think about what your what the what the ultimate goal of of this work is? the the ultimate The ultimate goal is 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 uh, you know I would say the final metric of success is when borders disappear, right? That's uh, mm. that's that's the final like there are no more borders because we, there aren't these you know feudal systems that control some area of land between this imaginary line. Uh, yeah, there, there might be cultural and, and borders and regional borders, but everyone is free to move across them. Uh, that's that's when I know my job will be done and our success will have been met <clears throat> in the in the short term. You know, right now it's really applied, applied research. So we're launching things. We're finding we're finding out what works, what doesn't work. 
uh, failing fast and moving on. Uh, that's, uh, that's really the, the underlying strategy. And, you know, we just have to pick an audience and satisfy their needs. And I think that's, uh, that's something that we're, we're trying to do um, with Giveth is what do the nonprofits actually want? Uh, we provided, we built a really cool system for donors, but one uh, part of our market segment hasn't been completely satisfied and that's projects. So what do they need? Um, I, I feel like, uh, I, there's this project out there called game seven and they're funded by BitDAO. I, I have no affiliation with this project, but I found that their, their system is really interesting. They, they did a research report where they interviewed everyone that they could in the blockchain gaming space, a hundred different interviews uh, with lots of big names. And they asked them what they needed, you know, what, what kind of system, what is missing for uh, making it easy, making your life easy. And so they did all of this on the ground research and then they distilled it into uh, 10 simple like pieces that they wanted to support public goods around the idea of. And so they actually raised uh, $500 million, most of it from BitDAO, as in half a billion dollars based off of this report. And the way they structured their system is uh, 80% is going to venture capital investments in the blockchain gaming space where they've developed a reputation to understand what will work, what won't work, and have lots of connections because of this report. And uh, 20% to solve the issues that were brought out in this report so that their portfolio companies can utilize uh, public goods in the blockchain gaming space to solve those problems and effectively have have an advantage over startups and and groups that aren't uh, as plugged in to utilize these public goods. It's it's a really interesting thesis and and, uh, an interesting strategy that BitDAO has actually used to fund AfricaDAO, EduDAO, and which is like a bunch of blockchain college groups and they're looking at they i think they did zk dow and and they're they're repeating this pattern of um, portfolio investments tied with public goods and i think it's really interesting uh, it it still only works for really large groups and i i want to support the small innovators but but um it's 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 very much modeled after what or it's uh, our strategy is very similar in its model where a portion of funding goes to strengthen the economy and a portion of funding goes to fund public goods. So, so I, I just think that there's a lot of innovation in this space and I'm, I'm excited to see, see how how it all turns, turns out. Yeah. Love it. Okay. So um, maybe two last questions here. Um, First, you know, I'm curious, I, I like to ask everyone that comes on the show really like what's your most generalizable advice for, founders of projects kind of in crypto world, web three world. Um, you know, I'm, I'm especially curious, uh, given your, I mean, given your tenure, right? Like you've been around for a while in this space and you've seen a lot of hype cycles. You've seen a lot of market cycles. Like you've just, you've just been there. And I think I'm, a, I think I'm just really curious, like what would you tell you showing up in the space right now as what's important or as to what to pay attention to? I mean, man, it is, there's so many pieces of advice. Number one, follow your passion. Uh, If don't, don't work for money, not in this space, in this space, uh, the market cycles, if you work here for four or five years, you'll get the money, follow your passion. Uh, You know, (laughs) the crypto space seems to take a lot of, uh, it's hard to work 40 hours a week in this space. You're going to end up, you know, really diving in and because there's so much information there's so much you know when i got in crypto is you could read all of the content and in that comes out every day now it's just it's unbearable there's so much innovation every day that you can follow and so make sure to save time for research to stay up to date and remember that this is not a competitive industry this is a cooperative industry network effects are everything and it's about uh, building partnerships and making yourself, you know, one of the things that I'm really impressed with is Gitcoin's success. Gitcoin, they created this matching pool that was able to basically influence a lot of groups 
to do their own to do viral marketing for Gitcoin, saying, "Hey, like donate one dollar to my Gitcoin project so that uh, I can get the matching funds." And every project that put something up on Gitcoin that wanted a piece of those matching funds is now advertising for Gitcoin virally to their community, onboarding. <laughs> Their their projects to web, onboarding their community to Web three so they can get a die and send a dollar. Um, yeah, and it's this kind of viral marketing that makes your project a success. It is not um, some sort of magical technological innovation. It's either you're connected to a lot of money and you have VCs in your back pocket, or you have built some kind of network game that will uh, allow you to have more reach than you could have ever imagined. Super interesting. Yeah. Okay. So last question here, what are you working on right now? And what's the best way for listeners to kind of follow along on the journey? Man, I am working on anything in the public goods space, basically. So I am a steward for Optimism, Gitcoin and ENS, uh, a high level steward. So I have a lot of governance power in those organizations. And um, especially in Gitcoin, where I'm an active uh, on the steward council, obviously I found a giveth. And if anyone wants to uh, have a nonprofit, has a favorite nonprofit that they want to get involved in the Web3 space, the best place to start is, is giveth. We try to make it easy to onboard nonprofits. They can log in with just a Google account, get a Web3 address, uh, and eventually migrate it to MetaMask when they care. And, uh, and we do this uh, donor reward system. That's just incredible. Like it is, it is, and we hope to integrate NFTs, quadratic funding, and anything else that can help nonprofits raise money with web three. Uh, the next is, uh, so if you're into donations and web three, give it as a spot. The common stack is currently working. Uh, well, we launched token engineering commons, which I talked a lot about. So if you're interested in learning about token engineering, uh, definitely join the TEC Discord and and uh, and start taking classes for free with the Token Engineering Academy, one of our partner projects. You can learn token engineering uh, faster than anywhere else and end up with a Web3 certification and become one of the first token engineers in the world. Uh, this, is, this, I think, is a very early industry, and I think that's the best place to start. And you don't have to be a technical person. There's a lot of pieces of token engineering that are not purely technical. Uh, the common stack is another project we're working closely with refi DAO right now. We're about to, uh, launch a joint venture effectively to do on the ground micro economies around, uh, regenerative finance in a local area. So think of refi Lisbon or refi Berlin, refi San Francisco, where they have their own micro economy and can coordinate effectively around a physical space and actually, uh, like have reputation systems it's it's going to be super cool so <clears throat> if you're interested in refi uh helping the environment with web3 tooling uh check out what's going on in the common stack in refi dao uh they have this incredible founder circle uh, hundreds of organizations uh small startups have kind of uh connected with there and have started getting, dipping their toes in the web3 space so really interesting things there i also um in I also found a DAP node, and DAP node is uh, if you want to run your own uh, personal server and run Ethereum nodes uh, or stake Ethereum on it in your house. DAP node is the open source solution. It's super easy. Get your own hardware and, and install DAP node. It's a Linux open source operating system uh, that is free online. Or you can also just make it simple: buy a box from DAP node, have it mailed to you, plug it in, and you're staking. Uh, so that's super cool and is really important for my ask, my dreams of decentralization. Uh, and in in launching these different economies, Dapnode actually has a token. Giveth had a token. Token Engineering Commons had a token. I I had a, I I kind of started up another dev team called General Magic that would float between these orgs to provide um, impact DAO services and. Uh, because like, you know, at different times, different orgs needed a lot of extra dev work. And so instead of 
um, going to other consulting agencies that we just couldn't afford. We grew our own consulting agency that is much more accessible to people who want to use Web3 for impacts, way cheaper than uh, Raid Guild or any of these other orgs that you can find out there, de developer DAO. There, but we only, um, you know, it's cheaper because we we only uh, support impact DAOs. So uh, definitely if you're, uh, and actually we're hiring, we're looking for a, uh, a, um, a CTO that can really help bring us uh, better architecture decisions and mentor our young devs. Uh, we have some incredible developer talent, but we really could use, uh, you know, a rock star solidity uh, developer that that has been through the ropes a few times. So, uh, oh, everyone needs that position, but I have to, I have to, I have to say it here. Another project that we're just launching that's coming out of General Magic is called Praise. This is uh, our solution for reputation. I think um, reputation systems are going to be like soul bound tokens are going to be really critical for the next uh, round of DAOs because being totally capital controlled just doesn't make sense. You know, this is how the current nonprofit and government space is today. It's it's completely capital controlled. And unfortunately, that's how Web3 is today, too. We need to give power and voice to people who contribute labor, have expertise, and the beneficiaries of the value that's created. And unfortunately, these three user groups, uh, if you give them, you know, tokens that you can sell, they're going to sell them because they need the money. Uh, so we need to give them tokens they can't sell. We need to give them voice, reputation. And Praise is a super simple, it's basically just a Discord bot that where anyone can say, I dish praise to Tanner for having me on this awesome podcast and, and allowing me to tell uh, the Wagme community about, about what's going on in the Giveth Galaxy in all these projects. And then that praise will actually get quantified, turn into a reputation token and potentially some financial tokens as well. And uh, and be sent to you, Tanner. Uh, and it's okay. a way to yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's really cool. It's it's a way to quantify qualitative contributions, especially for labor, and uh, and it's a piece of of uh, contributor management. And it also has second order effects of just creating a culture of gratitude within your community. And uh, and I think that's really important because this is how you get that positive soft governance. Uh, feedback cycles where you're building, um, you know, a trust, a community built on trust uh, so people can talk to each other and praise really does that. So, Love it. yeah, and there's probably a few other organizations that I can't even think of right now, I'm like looking at the stickers behind me, um, but, uh, but that's probably enough. I, I, <laughs> uh, oh, the one thing praise is looking for a non-technical fundraiser, a CEO. So if you think reputation systems, I think it's going to be amazing because we're going to effectively integrate a lot of the, the upcoming AI technology to build like this data around praise, a contrib contributor praise. It It is so rich. This person praises that person for doing this. And then you get this text data that AI bots are going to be able to create auto-generated um, you know, org charts and bios and, and, you know, how does a DAO show off their core team? Well, it, it, Praise could automate these things. And so we're really excited about Praise as a product and we have a CTO already for it. We need, we need someone who knows how to do fundraising. So if anyone in the Wagami community is excited about reputation systems, AI, and, and creating cultures of gratitude around them, uh, definitely reach out to General Magic and we will, uh, we will uh, connect you and do some interviews. Amazing. Griff, thank you so much for the time. I mean, we probably could have talked for another two hours, but this is awesome insight and uh, insight and wisdom. I mean, truly, uh, I have to imagine hard one at times, but really, really interesting. And uh, yeah, for anyone that's looking for a new project, Griff gave us some awesome ones. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to follow along the journey. Thank you so much and uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, Tanner, uh, and I'll talk, I'm sure we'll chat uh, chat soon. <laughs>